I think we have a uh, uh, representation of all five continents, maybe four. I'm going to share my screen now, and we'll click quickly dive in to things. Um, unfortunately, um. I um, won't be able to look and see all of you while I'm presenting or uh, read your um, uh, comments. And so um, if you have any comments, please write them down. Nuria will gather all the comments and will let me know later on when we have the time or the ability to, uh, uh, to open for Q&A. Let's start. I gave you a heads up just a couple of days before, and I asked you uh, for two things if I may. Uh, one was the um, uh, for you to answer a very quick question. What is innovation to you? One, two, three words that encapsulate whatever you think about innovation. The second was for you to get ready with a piece of paper and a pen and or pencil, as well as four pieces of coins of the same size. As we're going to take, uh, being true to uh, innovation spirit, we're going to take just a little bit of different approach here for you to... Um, really try yourself innovation at play because that's our session. So you captured, you did capture a lot of the good ideas of innovation and what innovation is to you. I loved your answers. And so basically you're a very smart uh, group of people just gathered here because you captured everything, really everything. You didn't miss a thing. You talked about creativity, of course. You talked about new ideas. You talked about a uh, different new method. So you now understand that it's not only ideas, but the method can be um, implemented in innovation. Uh, risk, uh, competitive ideas. You talked about risk. I love that. Someone is realizing, or a couple of you are realizing that risk is involved when we talk about innovation. Effective optimization. To be effective, to optimize, change for better thinking positive, adoption, useful ideas. Wow, smart. I loved your answers. It was extremely well. And so if everything is so understood, why are we here? Aren't we uh, able to um, practice innovation or, or spur innovation on a daily basis? So apparently it's a bit of a conundrum. Let's dive right in. When you think about innovation, we contemplate about innovation, most of the time we think about the big ideas, the big things, the, the um, uh, poster childs of innovation, whether it's uh, the invention of the light bulb, bulb, the invention or the creation and the invention of communication via phones, the first phones, the first motorized vehicles, nuclear atom, nuclear bomb, chat GPT, if to be more recent, and so those are the child, poster childs of innovation. Those are the disruptive innovation parts. But innovation takes place all the time in many different places and areas. I know you guys are from different walks of life. Um, you have different experiences. So I started to gather, I, I, I was aiming to gather some kind of a more holistic view about innovation and give you tools that will benefit all of you, no matter where you are or what you do. So what is innovation? I walked for the internet, looked for answers, not only regular internet, not Google, but AI. The first AI I used was Gemini. Gemini is the Google's branded AI, the new branded AI called BARD just recently. And um, Google's AI suggested innovation is introducing something new and valuable. You said it yourselves. Microsoft Copilot, another AI based on the renowned uh, ChatGPT4 by OpenAI says it's a new idea, methods, products, services, or solution that have a significant positive impact and value. You capture that as well. The renowned Harvard Business School in the United States says a product, service, business model, or strategy that both that's both novel and useful. You did capture it all. So are we able? to push innovation in our daily lives. Innovation involves with a couple of things, should involve a couple of things, challenging the status quo. So you need to push the boundaries from whatever you've done traditionally or commonly to something which is new or different. 
thinking out of the box, whatever that means, and we'll dive into that later on, taking calculated risks. I told you I loved your answers about risks. You capture that perfectly. It's about taking risks. Some are calculated, some are less calculated, but still you're taking risks to drive progress and achieve breakthrough outcomes. It also requires a mindset. And the mindset is very important. I will touch base on that as well, that embraces change, welcomes ideation, and encourages experimentation. That's key. And that's key. You are here in this session, most probably because you take interest, you want to be more innovative, and not less important, we have a reputation is and Israelis of being more innovative. That's the requirement, that requirement of a mindset is a huge part of why we are as Israelis are much more innovative, not much more innovative, but somewhat more innovative than other nations. So let's move on. First, I have great good, uh, news for you. Good news. I'm not going to withhold any information. I'm going to give you everything. Really, I'm going to give you everything. Everything there is, if time permits, I'm going to give you everything. I'm not going to withhold anything. But you see the empty part. Here comes the bad news. So I have some bad news as well. And the bad news relates to practices and support. I gave two examples here. I use it a lot. Um, let's talk about chess. So it's a fairly simple game in terms of rules, right? So you have a checkerboard, blacks and white. Then you have your pieces, your tools, and simple rules apply for each. The pawns go this way. Um, bishop can go that way. That's it, basically. Everyone can learn it. It's pretty easy to learn. You learn the basics. You learn the, uh, the rules. But does it mean that applying it successfully and playing against, I don't know, uh, a chess master would be able to, would, would we be able to, uh, to beat the chess master that easily? So the question, that the question may seem pretty simple and the answer is simple as well. Of course not. You, the, the, the gap between whatever you know and how you can harness it in real life is huge. And for that, you need to practice. And here again, I gave a very good example. If you have children, you know it. You were children yourselves. Sometime I do remember myself running after my uh, my kids, trying to help them out with uh, their first steps riding bicycles. You can show someone who doesn't know how to uh, ride a bicycle 50, 500 hours of YouTube um, uh, tutorials of how to ride bicycles, right? the physics of it, the dynamics behind it, the psychology, um, the mechanics behind it, everything. And then for the first time, you'll give that person a bicycle. Would they be able to actually ride it successfully? Of course not. They, they must fail. They must fall. And a lot of times before they can master it up. This is why that's the bad news. So the good news, I'm going to let you in the secret. I'm going to give you everything. The bad news you will have to practice and you have to have some kind of a supportive system to help you out in the first steps, steps and maybe even later on. I also have some exciting news. And the exciting news is that not only that I have everything to give you and discouraging you to say that you need some to put some a lot of time and effort to make it happen, the exciting news is you're going to experience today how innovation feels like very simple so we're going to take some measures and you are going to feel innovation at play today that's the exciting news hope you're excited so let's dive in just directly for innovation i want to put forward my claim and my claim is very simple innovation is for everyone Remember that innovation is for everyone. It's not, you don't have to be Isaac Newton and an apple should fall on your head. You don't have to be Isaac Einstein. You don't. It can be anyone. It can be everyone. It needs practice. And more so, it needs the inners and outs of how to actually practice it correctly. That's what we're going to talk about today. And it's a practicable thing. You can practice it more and more and ever more and get better and better at it. 
until one day it will be like a second nature to you and not a one-off, if at all. So when you ask people, hey, what is innovation? Everyone knows how to talk, talk about it. Are you innovative? Now most people stumble. We're going to take steps today that you can continue later on. Maybe some help, maybe with some support, a lot of practice, but still it's doable. So as Nuria said, my name is Ariel Brosh, and you will be surprised to know that my name is not after the um, uh, mermaid Ariel. So I'm not a mermaid. Uh, my name is actually a biblical name. It's comprised of uh, two Hebrew words. The first is Ari, and the second is El. Ari means lion, and El means God. Basically, my name translates to Lion of God. It's a biblical name. It, it appears in the Old Testament, in the Bible. Uh, it's one of the names of Jerusalem, as well as one of the names of uh, the angels in the Bible. So I take a lot of pride in my name. I'm 53 years old. Not as Nuria said, I don't have 25 years, uh, years of experience. I have 35 years of experience already. So she, she knows me for that long. So <laughs> she, kept, she kept my age. <laughs> Thank you for that, Nuria. <laughs> I'm married for 23 years. Uh, I have a 19-year-old uh, boy and a 14-year-old girl. And I haven't had startups. Uh, now is the fourth one. And maybe we're going to talk about it later on. Basically, I'm, I've been working for many years in the high-tech industry, for many, many years in the high-tech industry, namely in the cellular industry. And so when this guy, this famous guy, Steve Jobs from Apple, uh, introduced and launched his disruptive innovation, which is the first iPhone, that was 2007 merely 16 years ago. I was fortunate enough to be in that stage, but I was not young. I was a seasoned manager already. So I've been working for a couple of years in the, in the high-tech industry and in, in the cellular industry. And so I do remember this innovation and do remember the disruption it made, the dent that it made. I also witnessed the flip side of that. One company heavily innovated, succeeded in that. Apple grew up very rapidly and the other nokia i've been to nokia headquarters in finland for many times many times and i've been there uh since the um, uh, early uh, 2000s it was a huge company it was the giant it was the strongest company ever and i've seen it happen i've seen that tsunami of a wave that this disruptive innovation was pounding on finland's shore and on Nokia's shore, and they couldn't handle it. They just couldn't. And we're going to talk about that as well. And so I've seen the flip side. I've been in and around innovation all my life and all my professional life, um, my personal life as well. I have some hobbies that I use innovation in. I, um, I uh, upgrade things and I, I change the purpose of things, repurpose many things. So I use innovation in a day on a daily basis and, of course, in my professional life as, uh, as well. My startups as well in nanoparticles, so I have innovation all day long. I like this saying because it says the electric light bulb didn't come from the continuous improvement of candles. And basically it captures, the picture captures the whole game of innovation. So you have the sustaining innovation, improvement by improvement by improvement, the small incremental innovations, which can be huge for a company that does it, but may not be as disruptive. And this and there, there is the, the other kind, the more famous kind, the disruptive kind. Okay, you use candles, better candles, more light, um, uh, more time, whatever, everything is more, cost less, whatever, everything is better until there's a disruption. Now we don't need the candles anymore to light our life. We have a new technology, a disruptive one. So we have a sustaining one. We have the disruptive one. Most of us will encounter most of our lives, even all of our lives, the sustaining one. And that's the one we should be able to focus on. And I'm going to give you a tool to focus on that. Of course, if you come across disruptive or you are part of a disruptive technology or method or whatever it is, codes to you. But still, the sustaining part is powerful enough to better understand the mechanism behind uh, innovation. 
That's the magical uh, triangle. Innovation, learning organization, and change management. Most people, and some of you probably, are confusing innovation with uh, being uh, innovative or being, or being um, uh, thinking out of the box or creative, being creative. Innovation and creation, much more the same. The second and the third parts are the ones who makes innovation different than creation, that being creative, being a great creator or great painter or whatever. So when we have innovation, that's fine. But if we don't have an organization, which any organization, a bunch of people, an actual organization, a country, whatever it is, who is willing to learn from their traditional ways and be able to move forward, innovation cannot occur. Yes, you have a great idea, maybe the best idea ever, but you don't, if you don't have people who actually take it forward and understand that that's better for them, there's no innovation here. And this, the third part, which completes the triangle, is the change management. Our ability to understand what makes me people tick. So any change that we have because it's innovation is, by definition, a change, something different, moving forward from or pushing the status quo. How do we make this change stick? So you don't use it once and then drop it and go to your back to your old ways. So the three of them are... Um, necessary to be to be in line together otherwise innovation cannot occur i was fortunate enough to hold position in my in my career for all three of them and for the last company i was working for which is a huge uh, company for um, uh, um, giving services for uh, cellular companies huge digest cellular companies all over the world amdocs i was able to hold all the, these three elements all together in the same room and to push innovation actually. So unlocking innovation secret, let's see how that works. So the first ingredient for innovation, what that is, I'm gonna give you some examples and let's contemplate on that. Through 1955 to 1975, approximately 20 years, there was a battle, there was a space race between the USA and what was then the USSR, now, now Russia. Many innovation were needed to be take place in order for human beings to take the next step, the next leap to space. One was how to write in space. Nuria gave you that example last time, whoever um, uh, participated in Nuria's session. I'm gonna dive in just a little bit and, and we'll understand the mechanism behind that particularly. So the question was as follows. I'm giving you the solution already because that's not the important part. This, the question was, people from NASA said, you know what? Our astronauts are unable to write in space. Why? Because they use ball pens and both ball pens uh, use gravity for the ink to drop to the ball and then to the, to the piece of paper. In space, we don't have gravity. What do we do? So they came up with an open competition and said, okay, people from the US, companies from the US, pick it up, try to see what you can do. One company did. It's called Fisher, Fisher Spaceman, Space Pen. And this company, Fisher, actually came up with a great solution. And the great solution was, let's pressurize the cartridge where the ink is, is located in pressurize it enough. And so even in zero gravity, that's fine. We can write in space. Not only that, now you can write even under the water. Underwater. Okay. The Russian went another way. What did they do? They thought it's through and said, okay, so let's use a pencil. Let's not use a pen. And the question is for you, just contemplate about it. Where's the innovation here? What's the innovation? Where's the innovation? Are the Russian innovating anything or are the American are the one who are innovators? Think about it for a minute. Maybe I'm gonna look at the chat to see if you are responding. You can write it down. I'm, I'm looking at chat, down, at chat now. Who has innovation here? 
Americans, Russians. Mm. You say American, US ones. Okay, almost unanimously, you think that Americans, you, you say, you bet on the Americans. They have the innovation here. Okay, any other thoughts? Both, oh, okay. Can you care, would you care to uh, elaborate? Just write one sentence maybe, why both, before I continue? Because Russian takes, take, took something which is uh, no. What's innovation about that? Exactly. Finding a solution to a problem. Exactly. Thank you. Let's continue. So innovation it go is both ways. Americans' innovation is a disruptive innovation, is something really new. There was never uh, a pen you could write on in space without gravity, without using gravity, or now underwater. So that's new. That's an actual innovation you can recognize. What's innovative about the Russian approach? So the Russian approach innovation was about, we have a problem, let's figure out what is the problem first. So framing the problem, framing the challenge, that's key for innovation. If you don't know the challenge, you cannot innovate anything. And they said, our challenge is not writing with a ball pen who uses ink is writing, period. That's our challenge. And if that's our challenge, our solution would be to provide with something you can write with. So that's a different method of using uh, uh, a pencil. So you're using now a pencil in space. You never done it before. The innovation part here is the leap of faith, the understanding that the problem, the challenge, once you understand the challenge, you can try to figure out what would be the solution. So thinking out of the box in that sense, thinking out of the ordinary, out of the traditional, Americans were very traditional. We need a ball pen who uses ink. Can you make it work in space? Yes, of course we can. Enough time, enough money. They did it. They did it wonderfully. Fisher pen, Fisher space pen, you can buy it today. It's a renowned company, great pen. So what? The Russians took another approach. In a minute, we're going to talk about why. Okay, I cannot, I cannot really read uh, your comments now. I'm going to relate to, to it later on, maybe. Let's take another example. And then I'm going to make my point. The other example is um, PepsiCo versus um, Procter & Gamble. So, um, mid-50s, there was a waging for war between PepsiCo and Procter & Gamble around potato chips. Would you believe it? It seems that uh, PepsiCo took a, uh, an approach of conquering the market. They bought every small and pop, mums and pups workshop who actually made local or national uh, potato chips. They bought almost all of them. And then they franchised it in a way, and then they uh, closed it in a way that no one else could ever use or could, could ever per, um, uh, produce potato chips. No one could. So Procter and Gamble were now were now driven out of the market. They could not produce potato chips. Not only that, they could even not name any product that they have as potato chips. And back then, potato chips were really made out of chips of fried potatoes, actual chips. You took the potato, you sliced it, you fried it, these were the actual potato chips. Procter & Gable looked at the problem and understood that their back is against the wall. They were in that market. They are being driven out of this market by PepsiCo and they wouldn't let go. They just wouldn't. By the way, if you go today, tomorrow, wherever, and buy a purchase in your country, a potato chips, which is not Procter & Gamble's one, which is, I'm letting you know, not now, Pringles. If it's not Pringles, it must be uh, franchised. And you could, you could see it's uh, a part of Frito-Lay. Frito-Lay is the company behind all potato chips. So every potato chips around the world, which is not Pringles, pay Frito-Lay, which is a subsidiary, basically, of PepsiCo. Would you believe it? Everything. It's a duopol here. World duopol. And so... Procter & Gamble said, okay, so we cannot use potato chips. It's not allowed. They closed it. 
we cannot use the name potato chips, what do we do? And so one guy, one chemist in their company said, you know what? I have something for you. He came up with something which is very different. It's a hyperbolic paraboloid figure or, or shape. The shape is as, sh is as such that he as a chemist would not be able to understand it because he's a chemist, but he had some knowledge and understanding in physics and in, um, in uh, architecture. And so he knew this kind of specific uh, shape is a very strong one. So the, we use it in buildings, we use it in every other way that we need when we need a, a very strong uh, figure. It's like a saddle, very strong one. And so he said, let's not make potato chips. Let's take potato mesh and then make out of the potato mesh this shape, then bake it and let's call it differently. Let's call it Pringles. So the name is different. The product is different. The shape is very, very unique. And this is how they solve the problem. Potato chips market in the world is over $16 billion a year. And that goes mostly to PepsiCo. The rest of it, 2.2 billion, goes solely to Procter & Gamble. So they gambled right. They gambled on the right product and they were not... Uh, afraid of taking some risks. They took risks. It, um, it's a long story. They took them more than 10 years to come up with this, but eventually they did. And once they did, they sealed the market in such a way that now everyone knows Pringles all over the world. $2.2 billion only for one single product. That's it. That's it. Another example and then the point. So you know now in Israel we are... Um, in a bit of a conundrum, you have we have a war situation. We have the Iron Dome, which you probably heard of. Back in the 1990s, Israel was facing a huge already then was facing a huge threat from the surrounding neighbors, uh, not not that neighbors countries, who called for the total annihilation of uh, Israel and were threatening us with uh, ballistic missiles, and so. We contemplated, as a country, we contemplated of, uh, around the problem. And uh, while not being able to strike peace agreements with some countries, we said, okay, what would we do next? We cannot be alienated. That's, that's, that's not an option, right? So what, what can we do? The problem was unsolvable. How to target uh, a flying ballistic missiles and uh, put it down before it hits the target? It was unsolvable problem. All nations were running for it, big ones, small ones, and medium ones, everyone were running for the solution. No one had it. No one had it, but we were threatened, actually threatened. Country says, other countries, enemies says, hey, you know what? Total annihilation, that's it. That's what we have for you. That's, that's what the future holds for you. It took us a while and we, the, we just had to do it, right? So we came with the Aero anti-ballistic missiles. The way we activated our solution or solved our, our challenge was thinking differently. How did we think differently? Everyone until then had the concept of if you want to shoot something down, you need to actually shoot it down. You had to, you had to penetrate the actual target, like a bullet in a gun right, or in a rifle. So you want to shoot someone, you actually shoot someone. It penetrates through. This is why everyone who thought how to conquer this challenge or overcome this challenge were unable. These are ballistic missiles are very fast. Uh, most of the time, all of the time, they are hypersonic, uh, very fast. They move very fast. You cannot catch them. So you cannot, you cannot really ram them with your missiles, with, with your anti-missile, anti-ballistic missiles. You just can't. So some, some guy in Israel came up with a solution. What if he said, let's take our missile and bring it close enough to the target missile we want to bring down. Close enough, but not ramming it because we just can't. We didn't have the technology then. By, by the way, as a side remark, now in, in the third generation of, of Arrow, of Hetz, 
we do have it and we are the first in the world. Now we have um, missiles who can actually ram another missile. That's huge leap forward. Now we have it. Israel is the only one who has it. But this was back in the 90s. And the first arrow was without that. And so we said, let's take our arrow missile, put it in the pro proximity of the target missile, and then detonate a small, a small uh, detonation that will take a payload of metals or whatever kind and create a cloud of metals pushing forward for the target. And if the cloud is big enough, but not too big, and if the um, uh, particles are big enough, just the right size, but not too big, they can penetrate the body of the actual uh, target missiles and put it down. This is how we solved the first um, uh, the first round while we, we activated the first arrow. It became operational in the early 19, uh, 2000s. And now, of course, we have Hetz, uh, arrow two and arrow three, and we're progressing still and still more. Unfortunately, this is what we have to do. I gave you some ideas. I gave you some um, notions how to do it, but why? So rule number one, necessity. Necessity is mother of all invention. And I would argue that necessity is the mother of all innovation. When you are with your back against the wall, when you just have to, that's a great motivator to push forward. You cannot push forward if you just say, hey, you know what? Someone else will solve it for me. It's okay if I lose. It's okay. For those companies, for, for this uh, example that I just gave you, people realized or understood or really believed that they cannot take a loss. Not only that, Golda Meir said the same. Just a couple of days after uh, the October 7th war just broke off in our region, USA's president was contemplating or was, was reminiscing about his uh, encounter with Golda Meir, our prime minister 50 years ago when another war broke off, the, uh, the Yom Kippur War. And so he was a, uh, a young senator and he remembered that she said, they, they talked about the war and the grim and the situation we are at. And he remembers that she said, you know what? The secret weapon that we have against our neighbors is not a better weapon. It's, we just don't have anywhere else, else to go. We have our backs against the wall. We cannot lose. We cannot afford to lose. We don't have any other option. And so this is war, this is life and death. But if you are able to take this understanding and push it forward in your organization, even in your family, even for yourself, if you want to push forward, if you really believe it, you cannot lie to yourself, but if you really believe it, then it's a great motivator for moving forward with true innovation, as you're willing to consider things that otherwise you wouldn't consider. You would open your mind. And that's a secret sauce, one of the secret sources of why us as Israelis believe that so strongly and we are so strong in innovation because it permutates. You have our prime minister of things like that. You can go and ask any Israeli. We all believe that, truly believe that we are alone in the world. Eventually, we need to stand up on our own because uh, in the moment of truth, no one will stand for us, even our best friends. We must do it ourselves. And that notion is so strongly embedded with every Israeli. It's not that we are smarter than other nations, smarter than other people, but it is embedded in our culture, in our tradition even. And so with that, we go every day and we think every day, how can I do things better? How can I make things on my own and not rely on others to do things for me? That's a great motivator, a great pusher for actual um, innovation. Next, you really want to stand out. It's a nice picture. You can stand out one way. You can be ridiculous on the other way. You talked about risks. This is then taking risks. It's so, so important. Innovation does not stand alone. Innovation is inherent with risks and risks are everywhere. You're risking time. You're risking money. So resources. You're risking your reputation. You're risking losing a market, you're risking a lot. 
This is why it's so, so important for a, an organization to become a learning organization, an organization can that can check the surrounding environment and say, hey, you know what? Something is changing here. We need to change with it. Don't be a Nokia, be Apple, be Steve Jobs. And so it starts as, hey, that's ridiculous. People will laugh at you. But eventually, if you push forward enough and you'll prevail, you'll be the Lion King. You'll, you'll be leading the pack. And remember this guy? I remember him. I was in the industry when he introduced his ridiculous bottomless phone. I heard the laughs from everywhere, from all industry members, from media, from press, everyone laughed. They said, this ridiculous. I was at Nokia after he launched it. They said, come on, it's not gonna happen. They don't have buttons, right? Later on, BlackBerry was still trying to push forward their product with all this full keypad. They didn't realize the change was here, is imminent. The tsunami is already flushing everything. They did not realize it. And that is why it's so important not to only have innovation, but learning organization change management. Nokia fell short at learning organization. I was there after I, the first iPhone was launched, where they were blindfolded. They were not willing to see what's in front of them. They were not really willing to see reality as it is. They was just denying it. And look what happened. Look, look who's laughing uh, lastly. And uh, Apple, they had innovation. They had learning organization because I don't know if you know, but a couple of years back, many years back, but still, they had another product pretty similar. It's called Newton. It failed miserably. They learned from that where they were not afraid. Steve Jobs were not afraid, was not afraid to learn hard and strong from mistakes, from failures and to move forward and change management. They used us as their people who need to change. Change management is basically making sure that every big change you're going to get, you're going to have, you're going to push forward. It's going to stick. You don't have to still push. It's going to stick and work automatically. Applying it on us customer, it took many forms. Um, iPhone, uh, sorry, iTunes, uh, pre-installed uh, slick application, uh, World Garden, as opposed to Open System, are just to name a few. So they did all three of them. This is why iPhone succeeded tremendously. It's not just the innovation. It's not just the slick product. It's the ability to learn from others' mistakes from your mistakes is, is the ability to make a real change for us customers. And that was a real change. Third one, Albert Einstein said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different result. Okay, let's put that to, to practice. First, I'm gonna give you an example and then you're gonna experience it yourselves. So the candle challenge, a psychologist by the name of Carl Dunker uh, carried out this, um, this experiment in 1945. So he gave a bunch of people a task. You have a candle, I'm gonna give you one candle, a box full of uh, matches and another box full of uh, thumbtacks. And what you need to do is to somehow take this candle, uh, adhere it to the wall somehow, and light it up. And by lighting it up, you must make sure that no wax will drip to the floor. And the only things you have to, you, you can use is all those three things. One candle, thumb, uh, um, uh, uh, a box full of thumb ducks, and a box of matches. That's it. So I'm not going to give you time because we don't have any to, to figure it out. The solution is as follows. And basically, the solution was back then pretty uh, tough for people to, to crack because no one realized, hey, you know what? The thumbtacks who are in the box, we can use the box and repurpose it, use it for other purpose, other than as a, as a holder for the thumbtacks, right? And when you do that, here's how you solve the problem. And with that, and with understanding all those three elements that I just gave you, necessity, and uh, be different and think and stand out 
And the third one, which is don't do the same thing again and again and again, as people did here, again and again and again, they try to do the same thing without realizing they need to go out of the box and really take the box. Now it's your turn. Hands on. Are you ready? So let's get ready. So take the piece of paper and the pen or pencil and please join me for the first challenge. It's called the nine dot challenge. If you know this one, please, you can step out for, for, for just a minute, take a minute or two and contemplate on the other things that we talked about. If not, give the others opportunity to actually tackle it. The nine point challenge is pretty simple to, to, uh, to understand. You need to pass through all nine dots and the rules are as follows. Rule number one is you have to use four line, four lines, not three, not one, not two, not five, four lines. The lines, which is rule number two, must be straight. Okay, two rules so far. Rule number three, so that's not a straight line, that's not valid, needs to be straight like you draw a line in a with a ruler, that's a straight line. Rule number three, lines must be connected. So when you end a straight line, the ending point of the straight line, the first straight line must be the starting point of the second straight line and the third and the fourth. Basically meaning once you put your pen down, you cannot put it up until you end line number four. That's, that's connected. And the last one, that's not connected by the way, that's not the way to go. And the last one, don't repeat a line. So if you have a line, you cannot repeat a line. You can cross a dot couple of times, but you cannot repeat a line. So four lines, using four lines, which are straight, which are connected and do not repeat a line, you need to go through all nine dots. Uh, minding the time, I'm gonna give you one, one and a half minutes to try to solve it. And then we'll move forward with the explanation and the morals behind it. Now I'm gonna have the time to look over the chat. Hopefully you're trying it out and most probably you're encountering some uh, challenges here. Thirty minutes more, and then we'll continue. Please try your best. Thirty continue. seconds, maybe not thirty minutes. <laughs> yeah, thirty seconds. Yes, not thirty minutes. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Okay, let's move on. I'm gonna go for the uh, for the uh, morals behind it. That's that's more important now. If you if you didn't know it and you tried it out, most probably you encountered this. So line number one, line number two, line number three, line number four, and you realize that you're missing a dot. You're you're not going through all nine dots, but less than that. So most probably after a couple of tries probably you'll try a diagonal line, right? So you try a diagonal from here and then you see you miss another point. And then 
you say, okay, let's let's get creative. Let's go, let's start with the diagonal. Let's go then up. Let's go halfway now, not full way. And maybe here with another diagonal, now we're missing two dots and you're trying it again and again and again. And I'm telling, I'm, I'm reminding you rule number three, that Einstein said that uh, insanity is doing the same thing again and again and not, and expecting different results. So that's innovation. Innovation, we really need to make a change. We really need to try to understand what are we doing wrong to make a change. Simple. Here we have a pretty simple, and you, you'll see it in a minute, and if I give you enough time, you will solve it yourselves. No doubt about it. Everyone can solve it eventually. You have nine dots. You have four rules. Uh, if I give people enough time, some people are trying to... Um, to push the boundaries with reality. Okay, I did it with five lines. Okay, I rearranged the, the dots. Or, okay, let's do it with a line which is curved. So trying to struggle with the actual rules. But even within the rules, there's a much jiggling um, uh, way here. So you can jiggle a lot. There are other things which are I never said and can help you solve it. Here's the solution. And then I'm going to explain more. So the solution go like this. You go with line number one, but you don't end it at the point. You end it thin air after the point. Then you go with line number two, again, ending it with a thin air, and then line number three. And when you end it with line number four, you've managed to complete the task or the challenge without breaking any rule or without, uh, without changing anything that you need. What's the aha moment here? What's innovation here? And that's innovation, by the way. This part. This part is innovation. Why? What's innovation? Innovation is thinking out of the box, right? What do you mean by thinking out of the box? It's, it's nonsense. I cannot understand what does it mean. It means, literally, that you need to push the boundaries. What is the boundary that, you, that we've pushed here? 99% of the time, we use our experience and our experience helps us and support us and saves us from danger, right? You would never never consider going, going blindfold and crossing um, uh, a busy street, right? Or busy lane. You wouldn't do that. You would, would get run over. A toddler would. They don't have the experience. We do. How many times we've been told, don't go out of reservation. Just color between the lines. Go, don't color out of the lines. Then right between the lines, right here, not there, do this, not that. We've been pounded so many times over and over again that we all, all of us as adults and I've, I've done this literally hundreds of times, people who don't know the answers for that and encounter this challenge for the first time will always go from one point to another point, starting with the point and ending with the point. 99% of the time, that's great. That's what makes you so professional. That's what makes you... Um, uh, so adults, right? So you rely on your experience. Innovation is the only time experience needs to go out of the window. You need to understand that those rules, that's the rule I didn't tell you. I did not tell you you need to start in a point and end in a point. I did not tell you that. And so that's a rule you imposed on yourself. Now it's easy to understand because I just show you what is the rule that you're imposing on yourself and that's easy to, to do. But innovation is like that. The ability to practice our understanding that we live actually in a bubble. It's a transparent bubble. We can see through it. Even maybe we can smell through it, but it, it, it protects us. But it's there. Once you realize the bubble is there, you can try to push it out. Let's go for another example. Now I want you to use your coins. That's the second one. Let's use your coins. So take your coins and put them in this arrangement in front of you. Now, the challenge is as follows. I want you to get to a situation where the coins are all in one line, one straight line. So going from, sorry, going from here to here. Two rules only apply, only two rules. So if that's the starting point, two rules apply. Rule number one, 
you can move only one coin at a time. Other coins need to stay stationary. So by moving one coin, you cannot push the other coins. You just move around, right? So you cannot push the other, the other coins and they will move. Only one can move at a time. And when you're done, when you're done moving it, it should touch two coins. That would be a valid move. That would be an unvalid move. Because it touches only one point, one coin when it's done, when it's done. So this is the starting point. That's a valid move. And that's a non-valid move. Okay. And with that, please try it out yourselves. I'm gonna give you again, we're we're just uh we're we're run, uh, running out of time, so I'm gonna conclude with that. But I really want you to try it out and I give you the moral out of it. So four coins, only two rules apply. You need you you may be able to move only one at a time without pushing the others. They need to stay stationary. And once you're done moving it, it should touch two other coins. And by the end of it, all of them, all of the coins need to stay to, to be aligned in one straight line. And of course, there's a solution for it. I'm gonna show it in a minute. I'm hoping for the aha moment from some of you when you were able to crack the challenge. Okay, in just a minute, we're gonna conclude that. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're running out of time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the solution now and some understanding around it. So, most probably, you encounter the same challenge. So you're moving things around and you're still getting a group and not four coins aligned. Here's the solution, and why is that? Why why is that innovation? So, you can do it with me. So let's start let's start over. So arrange arrange it before you, and do it with me. So you'll have you'll have the, the sense of, of the solution. You start with coin number one, goes like this. I follow the rules, some of the rules, and still I'm breaking my own rules. Here's the another one. Here's the, la the, the third one, and probably you can see that the last one would be this. So I want you, I'm going back here and I want to see what is the, what is the aha moment? The aha moment we're here, the breaking the rules here is that most of us, again, we're abiding to the rules, yes, but to other rules, no one told you. That's innovation. You can abide to some rules because you're not uh, working in a vacuum. You cannot break all the rules. Some rules always apply, but other rules you can break. Which one is breakable? The rule that says that everything needs to be crammed together. Everything needs to be crammed together. So first move would be this. That's fine. The aha moment, the breaking point is this. That's the innovation part. And it doesn't have to be that you invented the new iPhone. For you, that's innovation, breaking your own mind, coming from this 
to this, the understanding that you can move a coin and the other coin stays on its own without the other team members on its own. That's the aha moment. That's the innovation part. It's so easy to understand, so hard to do, and you need a lot of practice to do it. That's the innovation part, believe me. I've been around innovation and innovated so many times. That's the innovation part. Breaking some of the rules you've put upon yourselves. Steve Jobs did not invent something from zero. He was just breaking some of the rules. Others, he obeyed to. Of course, you cannot break everything, but others he did. And of course, this one, and then that one. So I want to leave some some uh, some time for questions. So I'm asking you, and I have the answer already. Is innovation for everyone? Of course. Do you need to be Newton, Isaac Newton, and uh, an apple to fall on your head to have innovation? Of course not. You need to practice. You need to have guidance, but the first three rules, and I have a couple of more still, but um, we don't have the time to, to cover them and it needs more depth to talk about, but that's that's by itself is enough, is more than enough, it's a lot. You do this, you have innovation. Take those two examples that I just showed you, great examples to inspire you to understand that we all live in a bubble, it's transparency, try to push it forward. No, yeah. Do we have more time or should I uh, stop here and um, have some questions um, maybe for Q&A? We don't actually have more time. Uh, hey. we, we... Not, not even for one question too? Nothing? No, 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 no. Of course, for a question we do have. I'm just saying that we don't have okay. time to, to continue uh, the session per se. And okay. I know everybody's been busy uh, trying to get the, the lines and their coins. And I hope uh, you had a little bit of fun with that. Although I see some serious faces here, so I'm not hundred percent sure. But anyway, <laughs> uh, yes. So now is the time. So if you do want to ask a question, uh, you can feel free to either put your hand up or write it quickly in the chat. So Ariel can, can answer your questions. Uh, hold on, let's just get this one. Let's open the microphone for you and you can quickly ask a question for Ariel. Hello, my name is Aigirim Kurmangaisen. I'm from Kazakhstan. I'm an EFL teacher at a local school in Aktube, Kazakhstan. And I have a question uh, for Ariel. Uh, what would be your advice for us to uh, start uh, developing innovational uh, thoughts? Uh, I mean, I think not only in teaching, but uh, in any area. What would be your advice? What should we start uh, doing? Okay, um, that's and a tough question because because it's too um, uh, it's too specific for 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 specific location. Broad in broad strokes, I would say that innovation comes from the understanding that it's okay to fail. If you do that, just that, and you you said you're a teacher, so children are much more flexible in their in their ability to think different to think out of the box we haven't pounded on them enough yet so they are not confounded to the box if it if they will they will thrive in an environment which is okay to fail there which is okay to experiment and things can happen in all sorts of different ways you do that just that you did a lot you did more than a lot thank you thank you <laughs> Okay, uh, I see another little hand, so I'm gonna open your microphone. Clement, you can go ahead. All right, uh, thank you very much uh, for the interesting uh, session. Uh, mm -hmm. I just want to find out what advice would you have for someone who works in an environment that is uh, guided by policies, procedures, uh, from a business perspective, like business processes and all the like. And then for innovation to work in such an environment, how does one have to navigate? <laughs> okay, of course, it's a great question. And um, sometimes there's nothing to do about it, but leave, the, but leave the organization because, only because one thing, people are unwilling to take any change whatsoever. If, that's, if it's that strict, 
nothing can do about it. But most times, oftentimes, that's not the case. If you can only find something, a small change, that you can show the benefit for it, an immediate benefit or a very visible benefit, and you can show the path forward without hurting too much, too many people, that would be a good way for you to start and um, and um, become like an innovation hub. Don't call yourself an innovation hub. That's frightening for this, this kind of, um, of, uh, of an organization, but go from the benefit side, go from the, from the positive side, go from the end. You can show, hey, I did this, I didn't ask anyone, just tweaked a little bit, a protocol, um, a method, whatever it is, look how it turned out. It turned out great. If you can, if you are able to show that, to walk that way very carefully, don't compromise yourself, don't compromise your company or your organization. But if you can show that in baby steps, in easy steps, I think that would be a great start. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for the question. Uh, I will add uh, one word and that is value. Please make sure that you do a check as well with other companies or with other uh, educational institutions, where they're doing, where they bring in value and see if you can get your teams to see that value, you can probably get them on board and to start uh, making changes happen. So, listen, guys, I thank you so much uh, for being here today. Ariel, it's been a pleasure, as usual, to have you. Uh, I thank have you guys, to tell you... Uh, yeah, just, <laughs> Nuria, Nuria will, uh, will make sure that the presentation I just presented to you will be, will be handy for you, as well as the recorded session. And not less important, you'll have my uh, contact details. Please reach out. Don't be afraid. Be more Israeli. Reach out. Uh, look for advice. Start, start to start start to uh, to have conversation. Let's see how that goes. And I, I thank you so much for your time and for your effort being here. Thank you so much, Ariel. Of course, you can reach Ariel uh, through his email address if you don't have it. Um, although it will be in his presentation, don't worry. Um, you can also reach me. I have put in the chat our Facebook page as well as the uh, our center's uh, website and my email address. So if any of you have any questions uh, for Ariel, something that comes up to mind afterwards, it's not a problem. You can reach out to us. And um, please keep an eye for our future activities. We do have other things coming up. So please uh, follow our activities in our Facebook page. Ariel, thanks again. I'm sure we Thank will you. be able to see some of these beautiful faces in our center physically here uh, in the not too distant future. So I do thank you very much all for, for joining us. And I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. And we'll see you soon. Thank, thank you, you for coming. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. All the best. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Lovely to see you all. We'll send the presentation to your email addresses. Don't worry, I've got all your email addresses. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you.